our keynote speaker, uh, Elizabeth uh, Kulendan. Elizabeth Kulendan is an anthropologist and a professor of geography and international studies at Indiana University in Bloomington. And her work explores how large bureaucratic systems affect people's lives in, uh, after wars or after profound social and political transformations. She has conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Poland, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, and in Germany, focusing on the privatization of factories, on food, agriculture, and eating habits, and on humanitarianism. Her first ethnographic monograph, Privatizing Poland, Baby Food, Big Business, and the Remaking of Labor, is a seminal exploration of post-socialist transformation. It was published by Cornell University Press in 2004 and is still being sold both in the original and in translation. And Dan's current research focuses on forced migration. For more than a decade, she has worked with refugees and internally displaced people, and the result of this research was published last year in her second ethnographic monograph, uh, No Path Home, Humanitarian Camps and the Grief of Displacement, which was published by the Cornell University Press. And in this book, she looks critically at the refugee camp as a space of both bureaucratic regulation and existential crisis. She shows that displaced people become stuck in camps not only because of uh, war, but because of the logic of humanitarianism very often, which traps people in states of uncertainty, extreme pressure, and eventually abandonment. No Path Home uh, is based on more than 16 months of ethnographic fieldwork in the Republic of Georgia, where Professor Dunn lived and worked in a camp for victims of ethnic cleansing. And her scholarly work has been published in uh, various journals, including Antipode, Cultural Anthropology, American Ethnology, Slavic Review, among others. And additionally, Professor Dan writes not just for anthropologists and geographers, so for the academic audience, but also for uh, wide circulation media, including Slate, Boston Review, Science Magazine, and so forth. The title of her tonight's keynote talk is Humanitarianism and the Manhunt, Migration and Predatory Sovereignty, and I want to ask you to welcome her here tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, Charna and Jens and Antonio. And before I begin, I, I want to acknowledge my intellectual debt to Jens Adam. And the, the, many of the key ideas of this paper were worked out over beer and sushi in Berlin this summer. So for beer, sushi, and great intellectual companionship, I want to thank um, I also, uh, well, I think I'll contextualize this just before I begin, which is to say that in the last um, three and a half years, the activist side of my work has taken so much more precedence over the academic side of my work. And as part of what I do, I'm on the um, board of directors of a local resettlement agency, Exodus Refugee Immigration. And in 2015, Mike Pence was the governor of Indiana and um, he tried to ban Syrians from entering Indiana. And we had a Syrian family in the air. We had to turn them around at the airport and send them uh, back to Connecticut. Um, so along with um, the American Civil Liberties Union, we sued Mike Pence and we won. And thank you. This is by the way the seminal, suing Mike Pence is the seminal achievement of my life. And um, we hated him before you did. Uh, and, um, and then they appealed and we won on appeal. And then he became the vice president and all was lost. So um, on, I left on Tuesday and Monday night before the Tuesday when I left to come to Europe, we were summoned for an emergency board meeting and um, asked if we wished to sue Donald Trump. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, so, um, uh, this is over a regulation he's proposing that would let states or municipalities ban refugees from their jurisdictions. So um, this, this, I knew this was coming. Uh, I helped lead the vote and, um, and we will indeed be suing him, which I'm pretty excited about. And um, 
so this paper was really built around the fact that I had been thinking so much about Trump's immigration policy. So this is, this is a paper very much based on my trying to think through the logic of Trump's immigration policy, which is Stephen Miller's Stephen deportation policy. I'm going to make t-shirts that say deport Stephen Miller. Um, and, and so you'll hear in this me trying to think that through. <coughs> On the 1st of May, 2019, Donald Trump asked the US Congress to authorize $4.5 billion in spending to address what he called a humanitarian crisis on the US-Mexico border. There was indeed a crisis on the border. Thousands of people from Central America fleeing violence had come to seek asylum in the United States. Men, women, and even very young children were sleeping outdoors at ports of entry most without food or money, and many in need of medical care. But the humanitarian aid that the Trump administration was requesting funding for was not the cots, pots, and tents of traditional humanitarian aid. Rather, more than $1.1 billion of that aid was money that would permit Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, to arrest undocumented migrants and to incarcerate them in overcrowded cold and dirty facilities run by the Department of Hu Health and Human Services. Another significant pr proportion of the 3.3 billion of aid would be spent to detain unaccompanied migrant children separated from their parents, many of whom were being kept in indoor pens or cages fenced with chain link fencing. Under the label of humanitarianism, the Trump administration was proposing an extraordinary level of violence. Indeed, Trump's new humanitarianism was taking place not only on the border, but also far from it in the interior of the US. In July, Trump announced that ICE would, quote, begin the process of removing millions of illegal aliens who have illicitly found their way into the United States. They will be removed as fast as they came in, said Trump. <coughs> As the operation began and ICE field agents began raiding people's homes, administrators sent an internal memo wishing them happy hunting. Many undocumented people began leaving their homes as rarely as possible to avoid being tracked down in public space. But undocumented people kept disappearing, taken away by ICE to federal detention facilities where they might spend months before being deported to countries plagued with violence and poverty. So what does the word humanitarian mean in the context of state-sponsored violence against migrants? It might be easy to see this merely as a form of hypocrisy or deceit, an attempt to cover a politically unpalatable truth by naming it as the opposite. But in this lecture, I will argue that in the peculiar logic of the Trump administration, Hunting migrants was humanitarian action. By chasing migrants down, incarcerating them, deporting them, and hunting them again when they returned, the Trump administration has created what I call predatory humanitarianism, a form of humanitarianism based less on care for the population than on hunting down perceived threats to it. The intersection of humanitarianism and the manhunt, care and predation, indicates a much wider shift into what Grégoire Chamayou has called synergetic power, or power built on the ability to hunt down threats from within. Synergetic power, I argue, fundamentally transforms the humanitarian enterprise. It changes not only the form of care being provided, but also the people who provide the care, the people to whom care is provided, and the state itself. So although the case I'll use today is from the United States, predatory humanitarianism is not unique to the US. It's gaining traction in many other parts of the world and changing the way we think about migrants, about care, and about the fundamental relationship of citizenship and shared humanity. So let me begin by talking about the move from pastoral care to predation. Migrants have often been thought of as what Zygmunt Bauman has called waste, 
human, surplus human beings who must be disposed of in refuse, refuse heaps such as refugee camps, asylum systems, and urban ghettos. Over the last decade, however, anthropologists have rejected this Agambenian view, arguing instead that instead of merely being trash dumps or sites for the exclusion and containment of displaced people, humanitarian camps often function as recycling centers, or at least they aim to, where damaged people can be disciplined and transformed through a constellation of services that discipline the recipients of aid and transform them as acting subjects. Humanitarians create built environments that encourage right behavior and ideology. They produce rules for the conduct of everyday life, and they make institutions that provide services ranging from job placement assistance to psychotherapy. Foucauldian pastoral power is, of course, at the heart of this biopolitical project. Humanitarians care for a human population in the way a shepherd cares for a flock controlling it and disciplining it in order to make it healthy and productive. To restore the lost sheep to the flock, as in the biblical parable of the sheep, humanitarians seek to integrate them, remaking them as newly useful workers quasi, and quasi-citizens and sending them back into the polity. But if biopolitical is, power is used to make some migrants live, others are left to die. Images of migrants crammed into boats on the Mediterranean Sea, of drowned children face down in the sand, and people dying in the Sonoran Desert are so well known that they've become iconic. This is more than just abandonment or exclusion from the polity, more than just a refusal on the part of wealthy countries to open up the doors. It signals that exposure to death, not just the governance of life, has become an integral part of the governance of migration. Ashilam Bembe has argued that today necropolitics has taken precedence over biopolitics, saying that sovereignty rests now on, quote, the generalized instrumenta instrumentalization of human existence and the material destruction of human bodies and populations. For the most part, this destruction has been achieved not by outright killing, but by creating barriers that drive migrants out into the desert and into the sea. Hostile landscapes where the risk of death is acute. Although this often is a death sentence, the killing is not carried out by states or their armies. Instead, it is done by the earth itself, which has been weaponized to destroy migrants before they can enter. As the anthropologist Jason de Leon writes of the US-Mexico border, the terrible things that migrating people experience en route are neither random nor senseless, but rather part of a strategic federal plan that has rarely been publicly illuminated and exposed for what it is, a killing machine that simultaneously uses and hides behind the Sonoran Desert. In this form of necropolitics, humanitarianism is turned on its head. When the Italian government arrests Carola Rocchetta, a German ship captain who rescued migrants drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, or when the US government arrests Scott Warren, an American geographer uh, who was detained by US Customs and Border Patrol for giving food and water to migrants in the Sonoran Desert, humanitarian action has taken on new meaning. Now helping, uh, helping migrants is an assault on the polity, while allowing migrants to die is following the law. Anyone who interferes with the state's topography of death or who interrupts the work of the kill zones is a criminal because they're undermining the state's right to let people die, a right which is now the foundation of sovereignty. It's for this reason that the Italian prime minister, Matteo Salvini, called Racchetta's re rescue of the migrants and her insistence on docking at Lampedusa an act of war. Uh, and it's the same reason that Scott Warren was charged with harboring, which is a felony crime. Although both Raketa and Warren said they acted on principles of shared humanity, their humanitarians were, in fact, a crime of solidarity, an assault on the state's necropolitical power to expose people to the risk of death without killing them itself. Passive killing with a weaponized earth is a new and significant form of state power. 
But what I want to argue here, however, is that this kind of necropolitics is merely a timid halfway step, something more than allow, just allowing people to die, but something less than killing them directly. It's been a useful way to test the social and political boundaries of acceptable action, gauging public outrage and expanding the boundaries of acceptable cruelty steadily outwards. The turn from pastoral power to passive killing is not an end point. The state can move from simply forcing people into deadly environments and letting them die to actively hunting them as human prey. This is the turn to synergetic power, to the power of the hunt. I want to talk now a little bit about the manhunt and about technologies of tracking. So how does a state move from passive killing to active predation? In the United States, the turn was actually quite literal. In March of 2019, two months before the request for billions in humanitarian aid for the border, Donald Trump's richly populated imagination went beyond passive killing towards active killing with literal predators. According to the New York Times, Trump first began dreaming of a state-built landscape of lethal obstacles. He wanted to reinforce his border wall with a water-filled, this is the quote, a water-filled trench stocked with snakes and alligators <laughs> that would hunt migrants as prey. And he demanded that co AIDS produce cost estimates. With leaving aside the difficulties of creating a moat in the middle of a desert. Um, in addition, he wanted the wall to be, quote, electrified with spikes on top that could pierce human flesh. When AIDS told Trump his draconian imaginings were cost prohibitive, he turned towards more conventional forms of violence and publicly suggested that border guards should hunt down and shoot migrants attempting to cross. When he was told that killing migrants was illegal, he suggested that border guards should merely shoot them in the legs. <laughs> like pastoral power, synergetic power separates the population into the citizens, that is the sedentary human population, and the others, the mobile population. Unlike in pastoral power though, the motive in synergetic power is decidedly not benevolent, at least towards uh, the people it acts upon. The synergetic state conceives of migrant not, migrants not as people to be cared for or even abandoned, but as diseased lambs that pose an active threat of infection to the flock. To preserve the health and welfare of the citizens then, predatory humanitarians believe they must hunt down and remove the migrant. So synergetic power does in fact contain a kind of twisted humanitarian reason, a kind of drive to protect. But to protect who? <clears throat> Trump first claimed that building a wall and preventing migrants from entering was humanitarian because it would help the migrants themselves by preventing sex trafficking. But his lack of concern for actual victims of human trafficking, as seen as in the sharp drop in visas given to them, made Trump's claims to be providing humanitarian aid to those who crossed the border ring hollow. As the head of a legal center providing pro bono representation to victims of trafficking said, quote, the administration appears to view trafficking as a convenient tool to justify its border policies rather than as a human tragedy to be addressed. So Trump turned his attention to another group he was claiming to help and protect, the so-called angel families, or families in which someone had supposedly been killed by an undocumented migrant. Um, although, as it turned out, most of the deaths were in fact not murders, but accidents involving drunken drivers. And although the Trump administration only found three dozen such families, uh, even going as far back as 1990, Trump frequently used the Angel families in speeches and rallies to portray migrants as a deadly threat that he had to protect the American population from. For example, in an Oval Office ceremony with the Angel families, he said, I'm not even going to try it and do the voice. Um, he said, your loss will not have been in vain. We will secure our borders. 
and we will make sure that they're properly taken care of eventually. The word will get out. We've got to have a safe country. We're going to have a safe country. So Trump appeared to actually see his request for predation as humanitarian action. He simply meant that it was aid for US citizens, for potential angel families, not for the migrants. Hunting migrants is meant to protect citizens physically from biohazards, gangs, drug cartels, terrorists, and even drunk drivers. It is also meant to protect them economically by ensuring that they have privileged access to a labor market in which wages are kept high by excluding low wage labor. It is meant most of all to protect the white English speaking population culturally by preventing the cultural contamination um, of, uh, brought by migrants and by preventing societal and political change. In predatory humanitarianism then, humanitarianism is no longer a blend of violence and care in the way that Didier Fassin or Miriam Tickton have proposed. Rather, it is violence as care, predation as salvation. In criminalizing mobility, the state seeks to provide for the health and well-being of one person by hunting down another. As O'Neill and Dua write, synergetic power is, quote, a politics constituted by the tracking and capturing of humans and animals, but especially humans as animals. This means that the synergetic state depends to a great extent on technologies of tracking. Like the pastoral state, the synergetic state is mobile and individualizing. That is, it uses technological means to discover information about individuals in order to, to uh, improve the welfare of the entire flock. But here, technologies of tracking and instruments of knowledge production are not used to discipline and control or to aid, but to track prey. Sometimes the analogy between people and animals is quite literal, and the tracking technologies deployed for humans are quite literally the same ones used for animals. For example, when Scott Warren, the American humanitarian, was tracked by Customs and Border Patrol, agents used the same tripod-mounted spotting scopes and motion-activated cameras used to hunt deer and other animals to watch Warren giving clothes, water, and directions from, to two men from Central America. But there are now tracking technologies that synergetic hunters use exclusively to hunt humans. New digital tools have made it more and more possible for both ICE and Customs and Border Patrol to know where migrants live, who lives near them, where they work, who their family members are, and where they travel. <coughs> By contracting with firms that compile data from driver's license bureaus, social media, pay stubs, and other sources, ICE learns where migrants shop, what cars they drive, and who they associate with. ICE even watches undocumented people's Facebook accounts, finds out where they sell handicrafts and used clothes, and uses this information to hunt and capture them. Uh, the story in, in the New York Times actually was about ICE Using a woman's Facebook page, she was earning some extra money by making pinatas for birthdays. And they posed as someone who wanted to want, buy one of the pinatas, met her in a church parking lot, and arrested her in front of her children. Other technologies promise even more detailed and individualized means of tracking. On October 22nd, 2019, while I was writing this paragraph, in fact, uh, the Department of Justice proposed a new regulation that would let it collect DNA samples from, quote, all non-U.S. persons who are detained under the authority of the United States. <coughs> the proposed regulation claims that the DNA will be used to track down violent criminals, and it cites the case of the railway killer, an undocumented <coughs> immigrant in Texas who was a serial killer. But as immigration advocates point out, DNA information is the most intimate information you can take from someone. And it can be used to identify not only a migrant, but their relatives. It can be used to know their histories and to provide information used to track them down inside the United States. 
The point here is that the state no longer just casts a wide net to find migrants as it does when it conducts raid, raids on large workplaces. There, ICE hauls in all sorts of people and then sorts them out and lets some go while detaining others. Here, instead, the hunters are taking deeply personal knowledge that under pastoral power might be used to discipline and care for a population and using it instead to almost surgically target individuals. In this, it participates in a much larger new logic of securitization, which relies less on mass violence, for example, bombs that wipe out an entire city, causing huge amounts of so-called collateral damage, and instead uses incredibly fine-grained forms of knowledge based on iris patterns, fingerprints, heat signatures, DNA, satellite spying, and intimate knowledge of daily routines to hunt individually named enemies. I'm thinking here of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi or Osama bin Laden. Uh, these people are then killed with in extremely precise weapons, such as drones, which kill individually rather than indiscriminately. We are in the age of precision warfare, one in which there is little distinction between migrants and enemies, and the same array of technologies is being used to track and destroy them both. Okay, I want to talk now about predatory humanitarianism's new subject. Predatory humanitarianism is not just an ideology or a set of practices. It is a relational field, one in which new agentive capacities are generated not only for the state, but for other people who enter into the relationship between the state and its migrant prey, often unofficially and quite literally through gaps in the fence. Like traditional humanitarianism, which spawned all sorts of non-state roles and institutions, from international NGOs to medical missionaries to self-appointed humanitarian aid workers, predatory humanitarianism also opens up room for non-state organizations and non-state actors. Take, for example, the rise of non-state hunters on the border. Along the US-Mexico border, Customs and Border Patrol and ICE are not the only predators. There are also vigilante groups engaging in a heavily armed game of cat and mouse with the migrants. An article in Newsweek shows the Texas border volunteers, a non-state group hunting migrants with dogs. And they, in fact, posted a video of themselves doing this. Um, in another video, this one put out by Fox News, militia groups like the Arizona Border Recon and the United Constitutional Patriots go out on patrol in the deserts of Arizona and New Mexico, searching for footprints and setting up animal tracking cameras to catch migrants on the trail. These men are dressed in military camouflage and they carry semi-automatic weapons, such as the AR-15 rifle, the gun most often used in mass shootings in the United States. Like Customs and Border Patrol or ICE, the vigilantes claim to be there to provide humanitarian aid, both to migrants dying of thirst in the desert and to the American population, which they see themselves defending. And indeed, when they find migrants in the desert, they very often offer them water and food and clothing, right before they force them down at gunpoint and call CBP to come pick them up. It might be tempting to think of these militias as rednecks playing army in their spare time. And indeed, some of them are. They're retired plumbers and airline captains and engineers who come on their vacations to hunt. But the field of precision violence that has been created by predatory humanitarianism means that many of the militia members have the training to go with the uniforms and the weapons. They are discharged veterans who have fought in Iraq or Afghanistan and who bring military routines and tactics to the chase. The vigilante hunters see themselves as patriots acting in the name of the nation state, a welcome volunteer addition to CBP and ICE, who they say are stretched thin by the number of border crossers and a lack of funding. The state, however, has a much more ambiguous relationship with the volunteer hunters. On the one hand, the Department of Homeland Security, the parent organization of both CBP and ICE, issued an official statement saying that it, quote, does not endorse or support private groups or organizations 
taking border security matters into their own hands. On the other hand, though, CBP arrives when the hunters summon them to pick up the migrants they've captured. They do not ask the vigilantes to disperse, they do not seize their weapons, and they do not arrest them, even though kidnapping and impersonating an officer are both felony crimes. Instead, Border Patrol agents often speak collegially to the vigilantes and even thank them for their help. So the tacit alliance between vigilantes and the state suggests that synergetic power is not merely the property of the state, as Grégoire Chamayou suggested. Rather, because it is a relational field, it's increasingly distributed to an entire range of non-state actors who can be prompted by the state to act in its name without actually receiving direct orders. There's, much been, there's been a lot written about the dog whistles in Trump's speeches and tweets moments when he makes oblique references to right-wing conspiracy theories or says things that, for extremists, imply an order to action while preserving his own ability to deny having made such an order. This has been labeled stochastic terrorism, or the use of mass communications to incite random actors to carry out violent or terrorist acts that are statistically predictable, but individually unpredictable. In the right-wing vigilantes, we see something similar. They repeat words from Trump's speeches nearly verbatim, but without attribution, suggesting that they have internalized the message and believe they are acting at Trump's behest, even though they've never had direct orders. And they post videos on YouTube of themselves doing this. Um, predatory humanitarianism is thus also a proxy war, one in which the volunteer militias ask act as stochastic subcontractors to the Department of Homeland Security, much as the churches who used to resettle refugees in the United States once acted as non-professional subcontractors to the US Department of State. Predatory humanitarianism carries with it a certain paranoia. As the logic of predation diffuses throughout society, people come to assume that somewhere, someone is acting in ways that will damage or threaten the population. This free-floating anxiety begins to pervade political and social life, making members of the population uneasy and suspicious, and creating a drive to hunt that becomes, as Catherine Verdery has written about another predatory state, a constant state of mind and an aspect of emergent subjectivities. The domain of possible prey is becoming boundless, not just the migrant, but the Jew, the homosexual, the intellectual, the liberal, and groups yet to be classified. The target of the hunt can shift with the political winds, allowing predators to shift who is prey almost at will, summoning, summoning stochastic hunters to pursue both real people and imaginary figures. And and lest you think I am over-dramatizing, uh, the farmer's market in the tiny town where I live was visited by the three percenters who arrived fully armed in order to protect a, a, a vegetable seller who was a member of the American identity movement. This looks like madness. When you hear some of these conspiracy theories, they seem completely unhinged. But what makes them compelling is not factuality, but the fact that they cohere. They appear to make sense because the elements of conspiracy theory are held together by the logic of predatory humanitarianism. The idea that there is a hidden enemy inside, one that must be tracked, hunted, and captured in order to save the weakest among us, is a persuasive frame, one that can knit together seemingly unrelated, disordered, or chaotic bits of information into a story that produces not just order, but a surplus of order, one that continues to make sense even as the target changes and the narrative about the danger it poses takes on elements of fantasy. It would be a vast overstatement to say that predatory humanitarianism is replacing pastoral humanitarianism. After all, the logic of care continues to operate not only in the private and NGO sectors, but also in the work of state agencies. But it is fair to say that predatory humanitarianism is diffusing. Its agents, its targets, and its methods are proliferating, 
entering into more countries, more state agencies, and more social groups, as it becomes normalized, once again, as a mode of governance. We see it infiltrating new spaces and new terrains, such as the Bulgarian-Serbian border, where a civilian named Dinko Valev chases Syrian asylum seekers on horseback or on a four-wheeler, with state-owned military vehicles close behind him to arrest any migrants he captures. He describes what he does not as immigration enforcement, but as sport. In Hungary, the mayor of Asotalam, a village of 5,000 people on the Serbo-Hungarian border, has organized local villagers into a civilian militia that hunts migrants in vehicles, on motorcycles, and also on horseback. The militia forces captured migrants to pose on their knees with their hands behind their heads, and then takes pictures of them to be posted as trophies on Facebook. We also see predatory humanitarianism entering more domains of social life. In Kevin O'Neill's brilliant new book, Hunted, by the way, it's brilliant, you should read it. Um, in Hunted, he describes Pentecostal pastors in Guatemala City who hunt down and capture drug addicts in order to imprison them in makeshift rehabilitation facilities at their family's behest. This extrajudicial imprisonment is effectively sanctioned by the weakened Guatemalan state. At the moment, the goal of predatory humanitarianism is capture. The state and its stochastic agents merely capture prey in order to isolate and eject it from the general population. But there is always the potential, once synergetic power becomes a norm of governance, that the goal of the hunt will no longer be capture, but extermination. As it stands now, extermination is even, uh, is even now done remotely, by deporting people back into life-threatening conditions and allowing other states or non-state actors to do the killing for the hunter. Like the manufacture of washing machines or the growing of grapes, the dirty work has been outsourced. But that does not always have to be the case, and the move from passive to active killing is too easily made. So I'll conclude. Um, the goal of synergetic power in the end is not actually about protecting the flock from migrants or from anything else. Instead, it is about building and consolidating right-wing movements. Um, I interviewed an official in the Trump administration's Department of Justice, and I got a very candid interview because this official is actually my brother. Uh, you can imagine what Christmas is like at our house. Um, and, and he told me, uh, very frankly, actually, it was really interesting, he said, Trump doesn't care about immigration, but he knows that old people hate immigration. They won't say it out loud because they know younger people don't want to hear it and will call them racists, but old people stand with Trump against immigration and they want him to end it, and he needs those people to win re-election. This echoes Shamayu's analysis about the goals of synergetic power. He argues, and I quote, extreme right-wing movements recognize in the hunting pack a social force capable of providing them with a base for their political hegemony. Having come to power, they institute a state racism in which racist hunting becomes the heart of a program whose murderous goals can then be pursued with the means of state power. So the point of the hunt is not to provide humanitarian aid or to reduce the number of undocumented migrants, no matter what just justifications are proffered. The point is to consolidate enough power to capture an entirely different prey, the state apparatus. By whipping up fears of invasion, stoking resentments against ethnic and religious others, and mobilizing citizens as hunting packs, Right-wing movements and their wealthy backers seek to hijack government for their own benefit, to hunt and capture the state itself. Regulatory capture is one goal. The right-wing uses its capture of the administrative state to change regulations in ways that, business, that benefit corrupt business. Along with this comes rent capture, a system that enables the capture of wealth through the exercise of violence and occasionally lethal power, as Jason Kahn's has put it. In this sense, predatory humanitarianism is not just aimed at expelling migrants or protecting the populace, but also at enacting a certain kind of violence on the very flock it claims to protect. 
Predatory humanitarianism is thus bound up in a much wider and more complex political and economic system, one in which the fundamental questions of politics are about who has the right to prey on whom and to what ends. The Trump administration has announced that its right to predation is absolute, arguing, this is verbatim by the way, that even if the president himself committed murder, he would be immune from prosecution. The question now then is what means are available to block predation and to end the cycle of capture, release, and recapture. Thank you. So I'm super happy to take questions. Antonio. Uh, th thanks. I'm very sympathetic with the notion of predatory humanitarianism. Um, but, uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, I wonder whether you, you, you can, uh, we can expand it a little bit in order to involve other actors in the picture. I mean, because uh, the way you use it, it, to me, it reminds, I mean, a, a use or rather a abuse or misuse of humanitarianism by state actors or vigilantes or militias or whatever. But still, it is kind of a, you know, abuse of what is humanitarianism otherwise, mm -hmm. right? Um, and in, in that picture, for example, the criminalization of NGOs and traditional humanitarianism is also part of that. And you mentioned Carola Rakete, right? So for me, it would be very interesting to understand what uh, humanitarianism, Trump style, and humanitarianism, Carola style, have in common. Um, and I was in Lampedusa myself a few weeks ago, uh, and um, every day a boat arrived, and there was this boat that arrived uh, one evening, and some people in the, in the village wanted to, to go on the harbor to help, right? Uh, and the NGOs that were there, they stopped them. They say, no, no, you can't not go there. And these people react to us saying, well, you know, we, we've been doing this for 30 years. You just arrived. Why we cannot go there? So actually, the, the, the fact is that now the solidarity is kind of monopolized <coughs> by a bunch of people, including the municipality. <coughs> and uh, there's been a profound transformation of the way people on the island see migration itself. So in the 80s and the 90s, uh, when boats used to arrive, people used to give some blankets, some food, and buy the tickets to the people to go to Sicily. So now there is a, in 2015 was created the hotspot system before there was already this uh, center. And now this kind of uh, you know, apparatus of solidarity has been completely bureaucratized and monopolized. Uh, anyway, uh, in a way, all the people on the island have been excluded from this kind of you know, helping. Uh, system. So I wonder whether this is a form of uh, predatory uh, humanitarianism in itself. Um, you know, it's very common that uh, after 2001, the Taliban regime collapsed, and you found immediately in a few months you have uh, hundreds of NGOs there because there is funding. Because uh, so one person from emergency. An Italian NGO compared rent in Kabul in 2001 as those in Manhattan. So to rent an apartment in Kabul in 2001 was like $10,000 per month uh, because of the NGOs and so on. So there is this attitude in traditional humanitarianism, you know, to, hurt, to act as you know, predators in a way, in terms of funding and moving where there are praise that there can be you know, donors in that sense. So. Uh, so it would be you know, interesting, I would challenge you in a way to kind of take together in, in the picture these different modalities of being a predator, which is uh, not a kind of a humanitarianism as a drift or you know, a t transformation, but is something that in, is intrinsic in humanitarian action, historically. Um, well, first of all, that's a whole nother paper, um, which we should write together. Um, but I, I think you're very right that there has always been an aspect of predation to humanitarianism. And that's part of the whole argument about the blending of violence and care, right? That much of what happens in the name of caring people is also in, uh, hunting them down and incarcerating them. 
right? Capturing them into the camp system, for example. Um, and, and so I, I think in a way that, that shores up my argument, which is that my sense is that when officials in the Trump administration say that their aim in you know, shoving migrants back from the border or doing child separation is in fact humanitarian because it will discourage other people from risking their lives to come. I don't think they're lying. I think they actually believe that. It's a foregrounding of that violence and capture in a way that traditional humanitarians seek to suppress or to cover over with, with um, you know, sugar and rainbows. But, um, but I think it, it says exactly what you're saying, that these are participants in a, in a similar system. And, and I, I actually do not take the discourse of Trump administration officials as speaking in bad faith. I think they are saying what they actually think. So I was wondering if maybe you could trace it to something else that is happening at the global level, at the global governance, my thinking would be maybe about Mark Daffel's work on the security, securitization of mm -hmm. humanitarianism and global governance, how we use security to allow ourselves to expand uh, interve intervention. Now, in the name of security, everything is allowed. We can go and interfere into sovereign countries' business. Is that a next step? what you are presenting? Um, I, I think that this is incredibly bound up in the logic of securitization, right? I mean, security is about providing safety to the flock. Um, and to think about the ways that, that care and aid have been, and, and violence have been bound up in this project is, is really important. But that's the hard thing for me, and, and the reason it's been so difficult for me to kind of get my hooks into it, is that, um, the notion of securitization has become, it's, first of all, it's a super, super big notion, right? And, and on the other hand, it's a notion that is mainly, in many ways, indexical rather than analytical. So it's, it points, right? There it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. But securitization itself doesn't necessarily give you a, a lot of analytic tools to dig into what's happening. So, so I think part of what I need to do going forward is to start, um, to start thinking that through and looking for sort of mid-level concepts to do that thinking with. Um, one thing I had thought about doing is, I'm a great fan of doing the uh, ethnography of trade shows. And, um, cause you can, boy, you can tell a lot about capitalism at a trade fair. And so I've done meatpacking trade fairs and book trade fairs. So, um, I was reading uh, that there are now trade fairs for securitization against migrants, where they're selling like technologies of tracking, and you can start to talk to them about their other markets. Like, well, okay, if your market is Customs and Border Patrol, is it also the Department of Defense? And, and who in the Department of Defense, and to what ends? Um, you know, what are the ways that your technology is used with other technology, like drones? So that, that I think might be my next step is to start looking at um, what, what are fondly known as the merchants of death um, in order to talk to them about the kind of capitalist logic of this unification of securitization and xenophobia. There's a term called competitive humanitarianism, which may capture a little bit of what you described in Lampedusa, where there's different actors rushing to, to extend, I'm not sure if you can call it solidarity, but I think what they have in common is that migrants are a resource for them. So I think this competitive humanitarianism came up by, I think it's in piece by Jock Sturrer that he wrote after the tsunami in 2004. And um, we know in, in Aceh in particular, different actors were rushing to grab a situation or a neediness. And I think what is interesting about it is also a flipping. You know, the needy ones are the NGOs because they do need migrants in order to do their thing and continue as an organization and so on. Yeah, it's indeed. When you work in, inside a humanitarian NGO, particularly a subcontractor to an international NGO or donor government, it is like immediately clear that um, displaced people are not the clients 
They are the means of production. And the actual product is not aid. The actual product is like four color brochures and PowerPoint shows. There is an anthropology of PowerPoint also to be done. Um, uh, a PowerPoint as a tool of governance and epistemology. But um, so, so that's the product. And in that sense, migrants become, yeah, as you're saying, an important resource for contractors. And one of the things that has been happening in the United States, because the detention ar archipelago is getting ever bigger, is that um, even the contractors, well, the, the, you know, Homeland Security ran out of capacity a year ago. Um, so they, they got a lot of contractors to um, build new facilities, which they're building in like old abandoned shopping malls, which also says something about capitalism, right? That they're housing these separated children in what used to be, you know, Kmart or Target. Um, and, and now the contractors themselves are running out of capacity. So, so there's a kind of moment where um, the more people you, you trap um, and try and deport, the more the demand increases to do that again. That is a kind of self-reinforcing and self-expanding um, cycle, self-amplifying cycle. So, so yeah, I, one of the things I really want to begin doing is thinking this through the lens of capitalism. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Sabina. I think it's really a great start for our whole workshop setting, in a way, the matrix of our debate. I just, I'm, I'm wondering, and it's, it's a way to get back to the Berlin workshop. I'm just wondering, what do we really get to still label this kind of power and, and practice and rationale as humanitarian? When you, when you explained and described the different fields, and I mean, mm -hmm. coming from the Ephros region, for example, we also have this kind of militia, state, paramilitary assemblages doing the border work. But, but when I listened to your talk, I was always reminded on Foucault's description of racism. Mm -hmm. When he described racism as an essential um, aspect and technology within biopolitics, he was exactly um, defining racism as care, as care for the national people, mm -hmm. and describing the, the object of the, uh, the object of racism as uh, definitely in, in a quite similar way you did as a disease, as deadly threat, etc., etc. Et and just my colleague was saying, said it's fascism. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have, right. we have already fascism. some labels for this kind of, you, of power. You, you do, although they're words that you cannot say in the United it's States like, and be taken seriously, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because the word fascism and Nazi have taken on a kind of comedic uh, resonance in the United States with like the Seinfeld soup Nazi. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it is a form of fascism, and I, and I think there have been a lot of analyses that talk about it as fascism. You know, I had a really interesting experience about a year ago, uh, which is that I led a group of six undergraduates to read the whole, the whole thing of the origins of totalitarianism. They scared the living hell out of themselves, by the way. I mean, they were just like melting down by the end of it. But um, it was, we, because, because when you started to read, I mean, now people like only read chapter nine uh, on the rights of the refugee, but when you read the whole arc of this argument, um, it becomes terrifying because you can see the other parts of it coming alive again in contemporary political discourse. And the chapter that, that, that ended up terrifying us all was not the chapter on the rights of the refugee, but the chapter on race thinking. And, and the ways in which the, the sort of embodiment of otherness happens. So I don't think I would, I don't think I would claim this as new in any way. It is a revival of the same logics that brought us, you know, both Hitler and Stalin, as well as many other kinds of movements like that. But it's, it's new-ish in that it's appearing in this context 
um, in a way that I think is incredibly difficult for American, Americans in particular to assimilate. Um, and so when you stand up and call it fascism, that argument has no traction. So for me to call it predatory humanitarianism, that this, that this has an aspect of care for the population in it, that the sense that Trump voters have that he is looking out for them is not false. Um, I, I think that's a kind of way at getting at that argument that doesn't raise as many happiness as fast. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, thanks a lot um, for your talk, and it's terrifying how some of the tendencies like are recognizable in, in the context of Europe as well. Um, but I'm just I, I want to ask you, first of all, empirically, like, is there any kind of counter movement f from within citizens towards these vigilante groups? Um, and if so, like, how would you conceptualize this? And would you relate this to a different form of humanitarianism as perhaps civil disobedience or a humanitarianism that is in some way, you know, that it, is it, would you conceive it as a part of humanitarianism, but on the other side of the spectrum um, in terms of, you know, how it uses power, where it is on, on, in terms of siding with migrants or against migrants, for instance? Okay, so first is this idea that there, is, there are these kind of backlash movements. So if you have stochastic terrorism, you can also have stochastic humanitarianism where people feel summoned out um, to give and to care. And, um, and it was really interesting the, the way that has a political effect. And the thing I was thinking about was when Trump launched Operation Epic, you know, Big Mouth tweeted it out like four days before it was slated to begin. We are saved from his evil only by his incompetence. Um, and so he tweets it out and this gives everybody a head start. And so the first thing that happened was that these immigrant groups were creating um, not brochures, not websites, they're creating memes, right? Like pictures that can be circulated fast through social media. Um, which are giving migrants like really interesting information that they can use to defend themselves. So the notion, the, the, the key notion here was the difference between an ICE warrant and a judicial warrant. And an ICE warrant is an administrative warrant. It does not authorize them to enter your house without permission. So they're coming up to people's windows and they're showing their warrant and trying to get them to open the door. But because this meme ripped through that community so fast, people knew not to open the door. Um, and in fact, this is, this is the end of the story that I really love. Trump promised millions of arrests and deportations. The actual number was 35. Um, precisely because there was that kind of immediate immediate um, pushback and people being called also um, kind of virally to help each other. So there was a, a really moving video of ICE trying to arrest a man and his son. They were in their van. So they're not in the, in the protected domain of the house. And the neighbors come out and physically encircle the van and stay there for something like nine hours until ICE gives up and leaves. Um, the, other, the other idea I've been kind of tossing around a lot um, primarily because the agency where I volunteer is itself, in, it's in, in, a, in the middle of a lot of transformation, right? We were like a purely humanitarian organization. We got paid by the Department of State, you know, 3,000 measly dollars to take people arriving from the Congo and put them in apartments and find them jobs and, 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 and leave them after 90 days. Um, and now we're finding that we're having to take a much more activist political role. And so with lawsuits, I'm flying to, Cong to lobby Congress a lot. Um, on my last trip to Washington, this is my, the best story ever. On, the last on my last trip to Washington, I got in to see every member of the Indi Indiana delegation except my second big nemesis, Greg Pence, who is the um, brother of Mike Pence and who has taken his congressional seat and and Greg Pence would not see me uh, probably because he knew I sued his brother um, so I get on I'm getting onto the plane and we're in the shuttle going to the plane and and uh, I strike up a conversation with the guy next to me because you know we're Americans and um, I'm like hey what brings you to Washington and he goes oh I'm a congressman and I'm like you're Greg Pence 
And I watch him get on the plane, and he has the window seat, and I have the aisle. And um, <laughs> you are my prisoner. Um, and so I got to have this long conversation um, <laughs> with Greg Pence. Um, he got an earful. Um, so, um, so, so now, instead of doing the work which I thought I was going to do there, which was like getting blankets and mattresses and you know, getting the kids enrolled in school, um, I'm doing all this kind of highly politicized lobbying work. And I am the person on the board of directors. Are you surprised? I'm the person on the board of directors who does this. Um, so I've been trying to think, think away from humanitarianism. Or, or the constraints of, of humanitarianism as it's traditionally defined, because it's so limiting to us. And one of the concepts that has been um, really prevalent in the states in the middle of this migration debate is the idea of sanctuary, mm -hmm. sanctuary cities, sanctuary churches. And it, it's such a loaded term, right? I mean, it shares so many of the characteristics of humanitarianism itself. It's like it's depoliticizing. It moves away, the focus away from the denial of someone's legitimate legal rights towards compassion, the gift. It centers the giver rather than the receiver. I mean, it, it, I've watched especially Unitarian churches using this concept, and you know, they, they almost never actually get migrants, but they feel super good about themselves. <laughs> right? It, it's a kind of, it's a kind of um, balm for white guilt. <laughs> um, and I have like super little patience for this. Um, so, um, so how do you think about it differently? So I started thinking about, uh, as I'm watching these militia videos, what they're talking about as their legal ground for doing this is the citizen's arrest. So I thought, well, if they can take on the role of the state, why can't we take on the role of the state? And so um, thinking through this notion that I pulled out of actually German German newspaper articles, of citizens' asylum has been really important to me. That, that, that we as organizations and as citizens could, could struggle to take the right to grant asylum away from the 1951 convention or away from United States Customs and Border Patrol and think about reclaiming the right to offer um, or to facilitate asylum for others. Um, so, um, I think that, um, I'm not sure what that, how that's going to end up, but it, it, it probably will end up with my arrest if I keep going this way. Um, but, um, but, but for me, it, it has become an incredibly meaningful idea that I'm trying to figure out how to operationalize, right? How do I take the domain of asylum, which the state has appropriated to itself and drag it back into a community which should be the basis of asylum granting. That's, that's about as far as I've gotten. Thank you. Alexander. Yes, um, thanks a lot. Um, so it's in interesting to, to, to think about humanitarianism not, not as health, but as a way to, of discipline and control also. And so the notion of pastoral care. Yeah. Um, so Foucauldian one is also one of the Christian right in the States and, and uh, they like to talk about, of course, trafficking and drugs, right? Uh, uh, so, but um, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, if you like to see this pastoral care and, uh, and the predatory uh, humanitarianism very much together and not as a shift from one to the, to the other, right? Yeah, I also struggled with this idea, and, and I'll tell you why I set them up as opposites or as sequentials rather than as right. elements of the same thing, right. even though they coexist, which is that it feels so much like the space of discourse has been taken away from even talking about traditional humanitarianism um, towards talking in the language of predation. So when I, um, I went out with um, Refugee Council USA on these congressional visits, and this is a big umbrella group that represents the nine voluntary agencies that um, the State Department contracts to for refugee resettlement. So we went out to lobby Congress, and, it, and they, were, they were really insistent that the correct tactic to use with members of Congress 
was to share refugee stories. You have no idea how much I hate this trope. Because I watch people being set up to kind of bear their guts as a form of spectacle. And in fact, where that used to move people, it's no longer moving at all. Like I, I sat and watched a legislative aide for Mike Braun, US Senator from Indiana, and we were with a Congolese guy and he's like telling his story and she's on her phone, right? It, the idea that there is a kind of human compassion that can be elicited in order to provide pastoral care, I just don't see that as working anymore. It's not working within the Republican Party and Republicans don't have any interest in providing pastoral care. The interesting thing about this that I haven't quite worked through is that pastoral care does rear its, its head about once every four years in presidential election years. And, I, and I've been watching it as a cycle. And um, Georgina Ramsey was at a conference we just had in Berlin and was also talking about this. And it comes through the figure of the homeless veteran, right? So we hear over and over again, why are we taking care of refugees when we have veterans sleeping on the streets? And, and um, I heard this a lot when I was trying to make uh, Bloomington, where I live, into a federal resettlement site. I mean, I had State Department approval. And, and then we had this massive, well, not massive, but loud, um, a group called Grassroots Conservatives that came in and opposed us. And they were always saying, you know, this figure of the homeless veteran came in, they would bring it up at every meeting. And then I'd say, that's a great idea. Why don't you go help homeless veterans? Right? I mean, this is voluntary activity. You don't get to tell me how to volunteer, so why don't you go volunteer over there? And they never did. And it's because, while we do have homeless veterans, um, and it's interesting to talk about the, the kind of intersection of the forces that produce both homeless veterans and refugees, as Georgina was saying, um, the figure of the homeless veteran is more important than the actual homeless veteran who disappears out of sight again every year. After the, after the election. So that's the only incidence where I really hear about, hear the Republican Party talking about pastoral care. So it doesn't, I mean, they might be analytically of a piece, but they're not existing in the same political space. Uh, I would like to ask you, in which sense can your ethnography can be considered as a political action? if it could be at all. <laughs> well, you have just hit the central question of my entire existence. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, well, to what, let's, you know, this is a question for everybody in this room, right? So, to what extent is, is political ethnography, is academic writing um, a form of political action? And for a long time, I, you know, when I was a graduate student, I would have told you, you know, like, to the barricades, I'm going to write about this in American Ethnologists, and that's going to change everything and bring down capitalism. And, um, and that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> I tried. Um, but, um, and then I went through a long period of despair where I figured that um, academic writing was sort of an intellectual game to talk to other intellectuals, but it, it had no effect in the world, particularly in the United States where everything's locked behind a paywall. <coughs> and, um, and since 2015, I have been really involved in public writing. Um, I, um, I finally made full professor. There's a political economy to this. I finally made full professor, which means they cannot promote me and they cannot fire me. Um, so I'm free, <laughs> and, um, and I can write whatever I want. And what I find myself, and I find myself surprisingly wanting to write a lot, but wanting to write where people will read it. And so I've started doing this kind of public outreach work, op-eds and magazine articles, and I do a lot of podcasts and radio interviews um, that actually circulate pretty widely. Um, I guess my, my claim to fame in Indiana right now is that um, I was interviewed by the Indianapolis Star and I called uh, Mike Pence a disgusting bigot. And um, it was printed in the paper, of course. And I got all these great emails like, 
I'd like to thank you for that completely inappropriate comment. <laughs> um, but, but I'm also doing another kind of writing which is really meaningful to me, which is ghostwriting. So um, one of the things I've offered up my services for is as a speech writer for other people. Um, so I write speeches for the executive director of Exodus. I write, um, I've written speeches for the president of Church World Service, which is a voluntary agency. And I'm now being asked very often to write op-eds and magazine articles on behalf of allies for refugee resettlement who themselves are not writers. Um, so I actually had an op-ed in the New York Times uh, sometime last year, but it was I, I was the mayor of Ottumwa, Iowa. So I wrote an op-ed for him, and he read it, okayed it, and signed it, and published it under his name. And and that kind of writing has become it's a way of coming up with of using my academic expertise and ideas to actually shape the discussion in the public sphere. So, and I really think that there are ideas. It's easier here in Germany than it is in the United States, but there are ideas that can cross the barrier between academia and activism and make a, a profound difference in how we think about doing activism or engaging with public policy. So um, I'm hoping that works out. I was working on the far right and new forms of nationalism. And the mayor of that village was a very important person uh, in, in, this, uh, in this scene. And uh, I watched some after, of the after observing three months long uh, this uh, event on, uh, in, in this village, so the arriving refugees, uh, the, the population, the local population partly supporting partly not, and the way how this securitizing discourse became hegemonic in the local level as well, which was supported certainly uh, from the nation by so the Hungarian uh, securitizing discourse. And the person has come, comes here, so after observing this for three months, I decided in the late August that I will go to the other side of the border and I will take my car and help refugees uh, to come and to cross the border. And that was uh, my personal story, how, how, I ended in, how I ended in this uh, new topic of, uh, of helping the refugees. Uh, and later on, in, uh, in, in late August, September, October, I started doing uh, interviews uh, with refugee helpers, volunteers in the nearby city, so it was not far from that village and in the capital city. And somehow, so in my mind, they were two separated topics. So what is the far right and securitizing discourse? And, and the other one is this humanitarian, solidarian, volunteers and so on. And I'm now so much shocked that somebody comes with such a huge experience like you and says that you have to find an approach where the two things should be taken or linked in, 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 in one dimension or one terminology or in one... And I'm still hesitating with this. So somehow, how? How I can manage this? So I just wanted to share you this shock. I, I, you know, one of the things I find really interesting, um, I also started doing some work on the far right um, after we were trying to make Bloomington a resettlement site and we had these grassroots conservatives come in and they started a fist fight in the basement of the Methodist church. They started beating the people uh, in the group I was with and we had to call the cops. So, you know, it wasn't a terribly dangerous event, but it was this kind of shocking outburst of violence for me. And, um, and you realize at a, certain, at a certain sense that the common, the common thing that is linking them is this notion of the welfare of the citizen, right? That's what's linking the discourse on refugees and migration with the far right's discourse about um, the, the right of a particular ethnic group to, to welfare and well-being. Um, and that for me was, was a real shock. And 
Um, it's not that I'm trying. It's not that I don't I don't demonize them. Um, I think many of them are 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 doing things which I find morally horrific. But I also have entered into a kind of sympathy where their their discourse, which I disagree with, I also understand why it makes sense to them, right? And and I think as ethnographers, it's incredibly diff It's incredibly easy as for us to be champions of someone we think is morally innocent and who's the little guy, and incredibly difficult to have that same sort of affective sympathy with people we hate, um, that we come to the table hating. Um, and then you find that when you start working with them, your hatred is, um, becomes much more complex. Um, so I, I think that we have to start to think about the ways that the far right themselves are talking about the welfare of citizens and how they are addressing the people who feel that, the citizens who feel that their welfare has been discarded. If, that, if that's helpful as a kind of central node. I was really interested when I was in Warsaw last week and found my first book on a shelf in a bookstore, which is, that book is like eight million years old, right? Um, so um, I was really shocked to see it there, and then a friend of mine told me that um, it's read in Poland like, for those of you who, did, who didn't read this fine tome, it's about factory workers being cut out of neoliberal growth in Poland in the 90s. Um, and so a friend of mine told me it's being read like Americans read Hillbilly Elegy, which is a story about why the people who have become supporters of the far right have become so disaffected in this period of ne neoliberal growth. So, so it, that's also about sympathizing with a group of people who I certainly don't agree with politically. I think the word predatory humanitarianism provides a language for looking at um, the Australian context too, which is where my field work is, uh, and the way that they practice hostile deterrence. So that's really useful. Um, I wanted to, to ask you a bit about um, the... I was thinking about the ways that people in my field site strategically mobilise words such as fairness and neighbourliness, which have cultural salience for a lot of Australians in order to actually bring more people along with their political vision for you know, an alternative politics. So they actually do this to try and capture a group of persuadable voters who sit in between people who would be considered activists and supporters and people who are strictly in opposition and are conservative and xenophobic. So they use this language which appeals more broadly um, to bring people on board and kind of almost a, um, you know, mirroring the tactics of right-wing populism uh, to capture a group of people and bring them on board with this alternative politics who normally wouldn't be uh, interested. So I'm wondering if there are any kind of uh, words like that that people tap into that could be ways to counter a conservative agenda that have more broad public appeal in the US context. And I know you mentioned sanctuary and asylum and this kind of language is alternative uh, modes, but I'm wondering if there's something that's a bit more, um, I guess to use China's word, vernacular um, yeah. in the American context. So um, we, have, we have tried um, very hard to mobilize notions of neighborliness, right? And so at Exodus, we hold these dinners where like the Congolese ladies cook with the Indianapolis ladies because they're neighbors now. And we talk about neighborhood integration and well, not integration. That's not really an American word. But we talk about, you know, sort of the f having new neighbors. In fact, I, um, I for a long time would not use the word refugee. I called them newcomers or new neighbors. And the interesting thing about, I mean, it was interesting because it scaled the problem down even below the municipal level. And, and I think that, um, I don't know if anyone's written about this, but somebody should, is about the kind of scalar problems of humanitarianism and the way it's been shoved into the municipality. So um, what I found, my experience was that uh, that was wholly un, unpersuasive. That, that the response, you should have heard some of the responses when we called them new neighbors and talked about hospitality and neighborliness. We got questions like, I'm not making this up, like, um, well, when they come and enact Sharia law here in Bloomington, 
aren't they going to start stoning the women undergraduates here to death because they dress so skimpy? I mean, it, it was this kind of super radical otherness, and there was no way to pull it back towards neighborliness. So, so I, I see these efforts, and I, I think it's, it's kind of in the same vernacular as, as telling refugee stories and hoping to elicit compassion. But I don't see them as being, at least in my experience, particularly politically efficacious. So I'm, I'm searching myself for another kind of language to get around that. Because that the, the discourse on hospitality and neighborliness partakes of that kind of, of very traditional notions of humanitarianism, which um, I think were very effective in the United States, in churches particularly, who saw it as their Christian duty to help refugees. But it wasn't very, it's not very persuasive outside of that. And um, in an increasingly secular uh, country has been not persuasive at all. Yeah. When researching, for example, populism or far right um, uh, movement, uh, we kind of assume a certain uh, moral superiority of our uh, narrative. See my eyes roll? So, yeah. um, so I wonder, uh, and. I, and also, I also very often ask myself what kind of how complicit we are, for example, in reproducing the agenda, government agendas when we apply for funding. You know, if you apply for funding on, on, with a project on migration, starting from the first sentence saying, you know what, we should open borders, that's unlikely to be funded, right? Mm -hmm. So what you do is uh, to make it a bit more complex without making the, your position explicit. So. Uh, I think there's a way to neutralize this debate to make them more, you know, so anthropologically more acceptable, you know, in uh, when we publish in journals and so on. So that's why, for example, when, when you were saying uh, about you know different kind of uh, publications outlets uh, where maybe your polit political ideology can be more explicit, uh, and of course the combinations of the two is very important. But I wonder whether you know the academic debate and, uh, and scientific debate itself should be a bit more bold in that sense, in holding political positions in an explicit way, rather so, than... Uh, so maybe I, think there's, I think there's a radically different difference. There's, there's a, a significant difference in context that maybe um, really makes Europe different from the United States. So I'm about to say things that are... <laughs> maybe overtly, uh, overly harsh, and this is the, my cynical side coming out, so I only half believe this. Don't worry, you're in Germany. Uh, what? Don't worry, you're in Germany. Right, okay, thanks. So, you know, I go to AAA every year, to the American Anthropological Association meetings, and there are a million, pa a million panels which are super politicized, right? The association had a long, bloody battle over, um, passing BDS for the Palestinians, for example. And, um, and I was um, opposed to that, not because I am uh, opposed to the rights of Palestinians, um, not at all, actually. I was opposed to it because I thought that the only outcome of that was gonna be sanctimony for anthropologists. And I'm really tired of sanctimony as a kind of moral, ethical standpoint undergirding research. I guess uh, um, I'm much more, I mean, I think there are other affective states which undergird our research. But if you read cultural anthropology or you read American ethnologists, like sanctimony and the, and the production or the display of virtue is, is, runs all the way through it, every issue. And I'm not interested in that because, uh, because I think it's not very effective. So I think people make their political stance completely obvious in academic work, at least in the United States. Um, and what it has resulted in is a loss of state funding for education, uh, for higher education. But I don't think that that production of virtue and sanctimony or the kind of overt display of politics in academia has changed very much in the real world. So, um, so I'm not sure what, what that means in terms of whether I think we should display our politics uh, in academia or in our academic writing. I mean, 
I will tell you that if you display a politics which is not part of the orthodoxy inside the AAA, you will be hounded out of the AAA. <laughs> um, and you're laughing, but I was, on the, I was on the Society for Cultural Anthropology board when the BDS thing came out, and I was like, I was really opposed to this. And I said, look, I support the Palestinian cause. That's not the issue here. But I also think that the association should be a forum for a wide range of opinion, including opinions we don't agree with. And I was literally hounded out of the email discussion. Like, that was not an acceptable thing to say. Um, so I, I don't think we're suffering from a lack of politics. Though. It's always in the comfort zone. So yeah. it, 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 it never, never challenges, you know. Uh, so what I mean, I mean is exactly the opposite. So it is, you know, yeah. to, to free. Free uh, ourselves from politics. I mean, yeah, in, yeah. in a way that you can express, uh, um, you know, forms of politics that go beyond mainstream narratives in the discipline, which yeah. are always there and, are, and they are dominant. Even uh, Elsa is the same. Yeah. Uh, um, um, here's the part where politics intersects with academia in a way that's really uncomfortable for many people which is the notion that, um, in fact, we live in a world which has strong political and financial constraints. So I was giving, um, I've been doing some research on the new uh, modular housing for refugees in Berlin. And these are very totalizing institutions. They're meant to provide this huge wide array of services. Um, to refugees largely to create skilled labor to re-inject into the labor market. And I was saying that for all its faults, I thought the moves were pretty good. That in comparison to the camp I lived in, in comparison to many of the other ref sites of refugee housing I have been in, this super constraining pastoral care project was a reasonable alternative for them. And I got crucified, I mean, absolutely crucified um, by a German historian. This was in Tempe, Arizona. Um, and who was, who, re and I kept saying, look, I understand that in a perfect world, we would do something else, but we don't live in a perfect world. This is the best thing that could be passed in the current political climate. It's, um, it is the only, it's the most expensive thing we could do with the most amount of money we could get out of the government. So it's not perfect, but it's better than the alternatives. It's the least worst thing. And, and academics, and her response was, we are academics, it is our job to critique. Um, and yeah, I'm an academic and I want to critique, but I'm also an activist and a, and a member of, a, of an institution, an NGO, that has to work with a limited number of dollars, an increasingly limited number of dollars. And so when you say to academics, you know, your political imagination is wonderful, but now tell me how you're going to insert this into a world of strong constraints, that is a much more politically problematic statement. Thank you. Thank you very much.